Hi, today we are going to discuss the effects of isocitrate dehydrogenase 1 and 2 mutations on the progression of glioblastomas. We're going to start out with some background information on the enzyme isocitrate dehydrogenase. We will then focus on IDH1 and IDH2 mutations and the consequence of those mutations. We will give a brief overview over gliomas in general and then go right into primary versus secondary glioblastomas. This will be followed up by treatment options and specifically how IDH1 and IDH2 mutations allow for new ways of targeting those brain tumors. Isocitrate dehydrogenase is an enzyme that we're all familiar with from the citric acid cycle, where it catalyzes the oxidative decarboxylation of isocitrate and it produces alpha ketoglutarate and also NADH or NADPH and carbon dioxide as byproducts. There are three isoforms of isocitrate dehydrogenase and they differ regarding their location and the electron carrier that they produce as a byproduct. IDH1 is the only one that is found in the cytosol, while IDH2 and IDH3 are both in the mitochondria. IDH1 and IDH2 both reduce NADP plus to NADPH, while IDH3 reduces NAD plus to NADH. Mutations of those enzymes are most commonly missense mutations. For IDH1, it is most commonly in the arginine 132 codon, for IDH2 in the arginine 140 or arginine 172 codons. And for IDH3, there have actually not been any mutations in those genes coding for this enzyme yet been identified in human cancers, which is why we will only focus on IDH1 and IDH2 mutations. These mutations cause a conformational change at the active site of isocitrate dehydrogenase, which is why its affinity for isocitrate decreases, and instead its affinity for alpha ketoglutarate, which was previously the product, now increases. Another thing that happens is that the affinity for NADP plus now decreases, and instead its affinity for NADPH increases. Here you can see a brief overview of the different areas that are being impacted by this mutation, and we're going to go over this in more detail now. One thing that happens is that the enzyme loses its ability of producing alpha ketoglutarate and instead it gains the catalytic ability of converting alpha ketoglutarate to D2 hydroxyglutarate, which you can see here. This is referred to as neomorphic enzyme activity because it basically loses one ability but it gains another. Another thing that also happens is that it no longer produces NADPH, but instead it produces NADP+. One of the consequences of that is that the reactive oxygen species levels now increase because the enzymes that are responsible for reducing these ROS are heavily dependent on NADPH. So low levels of NADPH lead to high levels of ROS, which have been linked to oncogenesis. And another problem is that now D2-hydroxyglutarate accumulates, which is an oncometabolite that is responsible for the hypermethylation of DNA and histones because it competitively and sometimes non-competitively inhibits dioxygenases, which are usually responsible for the demethylation of DNA and histones, thus leading to this more condensed heterochromatin. This and the resulting lower gene expression has been linked to this progenitor-like phenotype here that allows for the tumor cells to basically develop. And another thing it has been linked to is the inhibition of DNA repair mechanisms, more specifically to homologous recombination, where those methyl groups are basically blocking the area that is being damaged, thus, preventing regulatory signals from being detected. And a third area that is being impacted by this mutation is glucose metabolism. Because the enzyme can no longer produce alpha ketoglutarate, the cell now relies on glutamine instead. So it chooses the glutaminolysis pathway to generate ATP eventually instead of the regular Krebs cycle. High levels of D2 hydroxyglutarate have also been linked to the inhibition of cytochrome C oxidase, also known as complex number four 
of the electron transport chain and also to the inhibition of ATP synthase. In the next part, we are going to focus on gliomas and the role that IDH mutations play there. Okay, thank you so much, Ulika. That was great as always. So I'm going to take over and talk a little bit about gliomas and then glioblastomas in particular. So gliomas are a type of brain cancer that originate in glial cells and are ranked from grade one through grade four based on how aggressively they develop or based on their malignancy. So your grade one glioma is gonna be the least aggressive and your grade four glioma, also known as a glioblastoma, is gonna be very aggressive. Now it is interesting to note that the previously mentioned IDH1 and 2 mutations occur in the vast majority of low-grade gliomas and less frequently in higher-grade gliomas like glioblastomas, but we'll get into that later. So glioblastomas were originally characterized into two subtypes, the first being primary glioblastoma. So this is the most commonly occurring and accounts for over 90% of cases and it develops de novo or spontaneously without any malignant precursors from pretty much seemingly normal brain tissue. Um, this occurs mostly in elderly patients that are about 50 to 60 years old and is very aggressive. So it develops in three to six months. Now you can see in this MRI of this brain on the right side, there's really nothing, you, you can't see anything, right? Fast forward two months, there's a full-fledged primary glioblastoma and this patient the chances are survival are very slim, which is sad. Now, not much is known about the mechanism of development for primary glioblastomas, but we do know that they share a few common traits. So the first is the EGFR overexpression or amplification. So EGFR is the epidermal growth factor receptor that's responsible for the activation of downstream transduction that controls proliferation and cell differentiation. And we don't really know how this affects uh, primary glioblastoma development, but we know it is associated with many malignant gliomas, such as glioblastoma. Additionally, uh, MDM2 overexpression amplification is very common to primary glioblastomas as well. So MDM2 is a protein that binds to the P53, the well-known P53 tumor suppressor protein or guardian of the genome, and basically inhibits its activity. So under normal conditions, the P53 protein could aid in DNA repair or cell apoptosis, but when MDM2 binds to it, it induces conformational change and basically ren renders the P53 protein as useless. So prevention of apoptotic activity leads to cancer potential. Now, the interesting thing is that the primary glioblastoma expresses the IDH1 and 2 wild type not the mutated version. So keep that in mind. So the second type of glioblastoma is the secondary glioblastoma. So it's less common and it progresses from a lower grade glioma or a malignant precursor, such as a grade two astrocytoma. It develops over a longer period of time. So five to 10 years, in this case, it's five years and it carries a better prognosis and survival rate. So it's not as aggressive as the primary glioblastoma, but it's still more aggressive than lower grade gliomas from which it progressed from. The mechanism of development for secondary glioblastoma is better known than that of the primary glioblastoma, but there still remains a lot of gray area. We do know that they share a couple common traits, and the first one is the TP53 mutation. So the TP53 gene is the gene that codes for the previously mentioned P53 tumor suppressor protein. And the mutation yields a loss of function, which inactivates tumor preventative mechanisms by the P53 product and is responsible for contributing to cancers in a variety of ways. This is the important part. The secondary glioblastomas carry the mutant or mutated version of IDH1 and 2. And it's yet to be established how exactly the mutated version of this, the IDH1 and 2, contributes to development, but it does not increase cell proliferation, which makes sense as secondary glioblastomas develop over many years, very slowly in comparison to primary glioblastomas. So recently, the presence of the IDH1 and 2 mutation has been widely accepted as the molecular marker for secondary glioblastomas. So in 2016, the World Health Organization 
did a nomenclature revision and renamed primary glioblastomas to IDH wild type glioblastomas and secondary glioblastomas into IDH mutant glioblastomas. But this gets a little tricky because there's a little loophole. Because we know that there are IDH wild type secondary glioblastomas and IDH mutant primary glioblastomas. Additionally, a study done in China by Wu et al. proposed three subtypes of secondary glioblastomas that was based on basically responses to different medications and the prognoses that these subtypes carry. So it's evident that even if the nomenclature is still fluid with glioblastoma and the progression and development is still being researched, so different therapy options can be applied that are more effective than what we have now. And that's what Madison is going to be talking about next. Regarding treatment, complete removal of glioblastomas is impossible due to the tumor's infiltration of brain tissue. However, there are treatment options that can help reduce tumor size and effectively extend the lifespan of patients. Surgery for glioblastomas is used on patients of all ages with the help of intraoperative imaging or visualization of the tumor with the help of fluorescent acid. However, even after surgery, the five-year survival rate for glioblastoma patients remains around 6%. Radiotherapy coupled with surgery has been the standard practice in treating glioblastoma since the 1970s. However, not much progress has been made since then, as novel techniques require long-term trials and patients' long-term survival rates remain low. The last standard practice used is chemotherapy. Chemotherapy via oral temelazolamide, otherwise known as TMZ, is the most efficient treatment process for tumors regarded as inoperable. Yet glioblastomas have been known to induce resistance to this chemotherapy. This graph showcases patient survival rates over a period of months. And as you can see, no matter the treatment plan, at the current moment, the outcome for patients with glioblastomas remains grim. However, hope lies in research regarding patient-specific genetic therapies that would ideally halt tumor growth altogether, as well as newly created small molecule inhibitors targeting specific mutations commonly found in glioblastomas. One of the most promising, promising of these being the IDH1 and 2 mutations. IDH1 and 2 plays an important role in glioblastomas. As Joaquin previously mentioned, gliomas expressing the wild type are high grade, and those expressing the IDH mutation are seen as low grade. Glioblastomas expressing the 1 2 wild type are more aggressive than those expressing the mutation, as well as being less adaptive to chemotherapy. It's hypothesized that patients diagnosed with IDH 1 and 2 wild type have less therapeutic responsivity due to the lack of vulnerability in the DNA repair pathways, unlike the weaknesses demonstrated with the IDH 1 2 mutation, such as histone hypermethylation. For example, Decetabine is a DNA methyltransferase inhibitor intended to correct the hypermethylation process by partially restoring the CCTC binding. This stops constitutive expression of platelet-derived growth factor receptor A and suppresses cell proliferation in IDH1 and 2 mutated gliomas. The dysfunction of the new metabolic pathways formed from mutant IDH1, such as new synthesis of NAD and histone hypermethylation, is one of the main reasons patients with the mutant type typically see better outcomes. In fact, just this year, a paper was published by Platten et al. detailing a trial of a vaccine designed to target mutant IDH1 in newly diagnosed gliomas. The IDH1 specific peptide vaccine generates T helper cell responses that have been proven to be effective when combating IDH1 mutated tumors in mice with humanized cells. The trial remains in stage one of human testing. However, the results are promising as adverse effects of the vaccine were reported to be grade one, the mildest of the three grades. While mutations in cancers are often expected to lead to worse outcomes in patients, the mutations in IDH1 and IDH2 seem to have a slowing effect on tumor growth and allow for treatments specifically targeting their molecular pathways. Research on the effects of IDH1 and 2 mutations on the progression of glioblastoma will hopefully lead to new treatment plans involving less invasive procedures, such as using small molecule inhibitors, targeted gene therapy, and even a possible vaccine. Thank you. And then these are our records.